Well, this is a, a kind of a derivative of and paying homage to Mondrian, who I like to defy because he was saying art should be flat and painting should be flat. So I decided to do a three-dimensional Mondrian, and instead of using his cubes and squares, I had gongs that I put into it. So it's a Mondrian gong. And I need to find someone who can play it. Several years ago, Dr. Julian Janowitz retired to his remarkable house and pristine woodlands on Ames Pond in Shutesbury, Massachusetts. He planned to devote himself to play, which he has done in the form of unceasing creative labors, making and installing sculpture, blazing trails, building stoneworks, and in many different ways keeping pace with the local beavers. With this profile, we will touch on just a part of Julian's artistic production. So I think it's has been a theme in my life to have this flowing S-curve that I think I'm hardwired for. Maybe all of us are. But I do abstractions of torsos and of female torsos. And so that's what this is, an abstracted version of a, of a torso. And maybe you can come in on the grain of the wood itself because I I think the grain is a beautiful, has a beautiful structure. If you can get that in there too. But that S curve I find is a theme right through my whole life of making that same curve. Like uh, very limited <laughs> images in my brain. One of them is everything's made of S curves. Well, they are the most beautiful, or the most attractive. So that from way, way back in my early teenage days, I was making S-curves, and they're still, I'm still obsessed with them. A stool that I decided to make after I had given my daughter the other stool that I had made, and the wood is circassian walnut that I had gotten when the university was enlarging 
and I came into work one day and they had cut down this magnificent walnut tree and I was eager to ask him to save me a piece. By the time I got back with my pickup truck, they had cut it into 18 inch chunks. And it was just a tragedy because it was such beautiful wood. It's got a great grain. This one I decided not to cut off the outside white. And I just love the flow of the grain. And the shape of the wood itself suggests what you're going to have left and what you can do with it. And so I have this foot sticking out. And I had a big debate whether to make it a footstool and to carve foot right here, <laughs> which is just perfect to be a footstool. But I couldn't decide whether that's just cutesy or a magnificent use of the wood. And just cutting into walnut of this quality that has no check marks, no splits, is a real delight because if you're using wood and trees that you have cut yourself, most of the time the cracks in, and the um, breaks in the wood show themselves and can't do anything about it. But a piece this big came out with next to no checking, no splitting. And it will darken. This is the same wood as another piece over there of the walnut. And because it's 40 years since I used the first piece of walnut, that other piece has 40 years of age. Well, this is the same Circassian walnut from that same great big tree trunk that came down. But I did this, I guess, 40 years ago, right after the tree had come down. So and you kept that one chunk there for 40 years. 40 years, yeah. I finally got to it. But you can see what happens as it gets a patina of age. This was the outer uh, half inch of the whiter wood from the same color on, on the other statue. On the other stool, it was really bright white. And here it has aged to be almost the same as uh, the dark woman. And this was a woman washing her hair. And I used a different technique of chiseling <coughs> the final surface to give its texture rather than using sandpaper and getting a high gloss and very smooth surface to it. But I liked the idea of a great haunch sticking out, even though, of course, it's not anatomically in any way correct, but it's what I wanted to do. And I like that surface of chiseled pieces. Very different from <clears throat> using the same wood, but getting this other finish on it. Now, this has, this has a, a different finish on it, of very smooth, so that you feel compelled to touch it and feel it and caress her mouth. And I was getting into... Where's her mouth? Where is her mouth? What a thing. Where? There is her mouth. There's her lips. She's got a pucker. And you're supposed to kiss that end. That's her mouth. And I, I was also uh, fooling around with negative space so that noses don't have to stand out from the piece that you're working. They can also be incised into it. But very few people recognize that it's a face, that it's a head. I have a cousin who said, oh, that's a nice fish. And he looked at it this way and said, it's a fish. And uh, I know it's not a fish, but Walnut is a beautiful wood to work. It gives very crisp lines when you cut it because it's such a firm, tight grained wood. And it takes to cut it very, very well. There are a few other woods that do that. Okay, 
Well, this is another very tightly grained wood that's great to cut, to carve. This is mesquite. And over a few years, this outer um, wood that covers the trunk was quite white. And it ages and gets to have curlicules. And, but this was a, a very sensuous piece that I tried to. Often my pieces are as sensuous as I can make them with curves. And invite you to touch. And when did you carve this? Oh, this is so oh, maybe eight or nine years ago. I had gotten a lot of mesquite pieces visiting my son in Texas. And we went to a firewood place. And I thought a piece of mesquite was going to cost a fortune. And uh, the man was just selling it as firewood. So I got three or four pieces for $2. <laughs> that was, that's the way to buy carving wood. <coughs> well, as I have been saying, I'm really not a sculptor. I'm just a cheap carpenter. I needed a couch for my living room. And this was the couch, and it came from this concept of a deer antler, which someone had given me. And as you perhaps can see, that's what the shape is. Even down to, to the roughened end, where the deer antler fits onto the head of the deer. And this section is carved that way, back into the chip carving, uh, chisel use. But it's oak uh, planks that I had cut from this place that where I live and had um, laminated up into a very rough approximation of the final form. And cut it down with chainsaws and electric plane and sanders, a particular kind of grinder that's available now for grinding away wood, like an auto body grinder, but it cuts with a, a circular chainsaw end. And again, my concern is with the smoothness and the sensuousness of the, of the piece. So I'm now on the end, which you carved with a chisel? The end, yeah, this end is a different texture, more concerned about the texture of the, the wood so that it would look more like this texture where the antler comes out of the gear. And it's very heavy. Most of these pieces are overweight. Well, I have been as infatuated with stained glass as with wood, the brilliance that comes from illuminating something from the inside. And so I've had a romance with stained glass for 30, 40 years too. And I've used different techniques. It's called Sapien Crago, the thinking shrimp. Crago is a scientific name for shrimp. And most of the pieces that I have done uh, that are large or are, are, are site specific and serve a purpose because I, I have always been interested in what the roots are of these imaginations that you have and it wasn't until this was done and had been up in place for a couple of years before it hit me as to what was retained in my mind to, to make this shape. And I think I still have a book around, excuse me.
architectural model. Yeah, our servicing the architectural model is unto itself a, uh, a model of beauty, human structure. It's just a, a model of beauty. <laughs> yeah. And meanwhile, speaking of beauty, here is the Ames Pond. insist on using medical terminology. It looks like blue balls to me. Um, well, it's part of the times, because on TV these days, you can see any amount of the most intimate kind of reproductive discomfort, uh, flows and, uh, and disharmony. So you can do the same thing with for males in, in art. This is the, the magical doorway in the woods. It's because when we were children, we always read stories about a magical doorway, which you would go through and then come upon all sorts of things. And I thought I would like to have my own magical doorway in the woods. And what you come upon depends upon which way you go through. So you have to read the sign that's on the wall there in order to get your directions. This is complicated. Dreams coming true are always complicated. Well, go show us and tell us about it. You have to come along. Well, there's a sign here, one written in Japanese and one written in English. You have come upon that very same doorway in the woods. This is the magical doorway of courageous resolve. Pass through from this side to a confrontation with the lovely woods of your most secret heart's desire. As you strike the gong, allow yourself access to the bliss you seek. Listen. As you pass through, take your fill of courageous resolve. Go for it. Or well, just enjoy the light path. So now here we are on the other side of the door. Yeah, and it's, of course it's different from this side. Uh, but you have to take it very seriously. There's some people in a nearby retreat who come by and they uh, take it very, very seriously. This is uh, the same doorway in the woods. This is the magical doorway of courageous resolve. Pra pass through from this side for a confrontation with the dark woods of your mind's secret dread. Strike the gong, allow yourself access to those fears 
Listen. As you pass through, take your fill of courageous resolve. You can overcome. Or just enjoy the darkness. But it's a different, a whole different thing about this world. As you probably have figured out, I am enamored of the S-curve. And I wanted to make the ultimate S-curve, which I think we are hardwired for, to receive as an aesthetic gratification, satisfaction. So I had uh, started to make an S-curve there. And I wasn't quite satisfied with it. Then I made another S-curve over there of big oak trees. And upon hanging them up, it turned out to be the seal and the eel. And they swing and have some life. And lo and behold, it swings back. And the same with the eel. It has life to it. And it becomes a kinetic art form, if you want to be pompous about it. The seal and the eel. Well, these think these concepts of male and female only develop later. At first I just wanted to make a very phallic kind of thrusting piece and have it appear as if that, heart, that diagonal was ready to fly like a rocket. And as I looked at it more, I realized that's a male symbol and masculine and right angles and phallic and thrusting. So of course, if that's male, I needed a female. And that's what the round moon shaped pieces with all of the obvious symbolism of a moon and a woman with a, a web in the center that she spins and receptive ready to receive that thrusting part. I don't know if it's politically correct, but it was the artistic intent. This is uh, a gigantic Coke spoon. It was a hemlock tree that was so magnificent I couldn't just bear to let it fall and die. But it's been out here perhaps 15 years and it's falling to pieces. And another thing that I've, I'm outliving. So we're rolling, we're rolling, rolling. rolling, rolling.
1850, cut from the broken ledge in the field convenient behind the house, on stone boat dragged down the slope to the stream bed. Stone foundation, stone by stone by stone, aims placed to support the mill, the thrust of the iron, the twist of the wheel. Ames sawmill at the highest thread of the stream. Mill ponds behind, remote in the hills, a sandy hollow. Church and post office a mile away, locks village down the bend of the road. Mill after mill, down the flow of the stream. Not a lonely business in 1850. See the slope of this cold land. Winter contours plainer on the hill. Understory gone now. Bare bones surfacing through the leaf litter. Vertebrae protruding down the ridge line. Stone slabs scattered in disarray. Dressing of fern, moss, and lichen. Porcupine scat mounded in the ledge caves. Snow dust coming very soon now. So Julian, what, uh, what are these poems? Do you have a little introduction for the poetry? Well, I'm very much enamored of this place and different ways of expressing how preoccupied, obsessed even, I am with living in harmony with it and reflecting upon what is here and what it does for me and how I experience it. So one um, summer, a couple of years ago, I started to write poetry sitting in different spots on it. And I um, tried to write them all out and even inflict them on my friends. Glacial cobbles tumbled and ground in the sandy, bouldered, scouring mile of ice. These nubbins of granite, Mount Mineral, Ames Hill, edges and ledges torn off and left to the gentle filling and blanketing of the accumulated sand. Drumlins and eskers, glacial till, left for us here in the in the hollow, this lovely sandy hollow. <laughs>